Hometown History is brought to you by Best Fiends. My favorite TV show as a kid was Unsolved Mysteries. My grandma would let me watch it before PM Kindergarten each morning. The episodes can still be streamed, and honestly, they're still a good classic. It seems like each year we find new instant classics, and you know what's an instant classic in my book? Best Fiends. It's the top-rated mobile puzzle adventure and possibly the best puzzle game. My group of friends all play it, and we even have a competitive challenge going. Connecting our game to our social media accounts, we can see what level everyone is on, and nothing feels better than being in the lead. Andy, I'm catching up. With Best Fiends, the fun never ends. No exaggeration, there are over 5,000 puzzle levels and counting. So if you were worried you'd get to level 3,247 and run out of fun, well, don't be. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends, without the R, Best Fiends. And finally, Hometown History is also brought to you by Ritual. Do you really know what's in your multivitamin? I am a stickler about not putting anything into my body unless I know where it's from, and that means that I need to trust the quality of the brand. Most multivitamins have all these fillers, like sugars, artificial colorants, not to mention animal byproducts, like sheep's wool and gelatin from hooves and hides. But Ritual isn't your typical multivitamin. I chose Ritual because I trust their product. I feel confident that what I'm putting into my body is of the highest quality and made specifically for people like me. Ritual makes healthy habits easy. Your multivitamins are delivered to your door every month with free shipping, always. You can start, snooze, and cancel your subscription at any time. You deserve to know what's in your multivitamin. That's why Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Just visit ritual.com slash hometown to start your ritual today. Have you ever gotten so fed up with society that you wanted to put all of your stuff in a sailboat and leave the world behind? Have you ever become so frustrated with the policies of your government that you wanted to declare yourself a sovereign nation of one? You could name your country anything you'd like. You can make up your own flag and your own passport, and you could travel as a diplomat on behalf of yourself with no one else to represent you. You could walk away from the paperwork, the endless paperwork of modern life, and use all of your energies on living your life and doing the things that matter the most. If you've ever felt any of this, you have a kindred spirit in George Dibbern, who actually did it, all of it. He created a passport unique to himself, which was accepted and stamped in San Francisco. He had a flag and his own personal diplomatic policies. And of course, he had a sailboat. He named it Terrapunga. Terrapunga remains a cultural artifact of some significance and is currently being restored to its original condition by a craftsman in Tasmania, Australia. To learn more about George, I connected with private scholar Erica Grunman who has literally written the book on this daring and singular figure. It's called Dark Sun, and the first 400 pages, at least, are terrific. I'll finish it soon, and I highly recommend it. Erica's connection with Dibbern is grounded in his ideals and moral convictions. But years before she encountered him, it was a family tragedy that had prepared her to appreciate someone like George. Somewhere along the line, there was a family tragedy. Our daughter died. So my husband and I began to think of life being different. I mean, we who needed a nine-to-five job? There was more to life than that. So we ended up buying our property on Cortez Island and decided to re, well, retire earlier rather than later. So we both quit our jobs and came up to Cortez Island in 1994, we lived to be here permanently. But before then, we were coming up weekends and we were having dinner with friends. 
Kirsten was Danish. She'd just taken a writing workshop. And the question arose, when you start writing, can you be productive in a language that isn't your mother tongue? And there was discussion, can you write well in a language that's not your mother tongue? And they came up with a book, and they said, we've got a book written by a German in English, and it's a fabulous book. And this was George Gibbon's book. They said, we will not let it out of our house because we had such a hard time finding a copy. And so I thought, oh, no problem. I would find one in Victoria, lots of used bookstores. And I looked and looked and looked and couldn't find a copy of Quest until one day a nautical bookstore said, oh, I've heard of George Mentu. I've always meant to read his book. I think Sherry Farrell had something to do with the writing of it. And I said, who is Sherry Farrell? She and her husband were sailors boat builders on the coast of BC and she said she had something to do with the writing of the book, George's book. So I randomly wrote, she said she had helped edit it and no, she didn't know where I could get a copy, but anytime, you know, come and visit. So we did that and it turned out she had a copy of an essay that Henry Miller, the notorious Henry Miller, had written glowing article about George's book quest and I wondered well what does the illustrious Henry Miller have to do with this guy whose book I can't find so I started looking for repositories of Henry Miller's papers and found in UCLA 79 pieces of correspondence from George to Henry Miller and 28 pieces from George Gibbon's family and one thing led to another, and the person who was putting together the definitive bibliography of Miller's work actually sent me 250 pages worth of photocopies George had written to Henry. And on reading those letters, I thought, I've got to do something with this. And that started 10 years of research into George Gibbon's life. And can you tell me about George? <laughs> 544 pages <laughs> in the biography. He was way ahead of his time. And that's one of the reasons he connected so well with Henry Miller. He was principled. Actions were, and his personal conscience, were a harsher judge of his actions than any court of law. So he went on a voyage of self-discovery and ended up realizing that he had outgrown nationality and as a result he created his own passport declaring himself a citizen of the world you can find an image of the passport eric is referring to on our website it reads i george diburn through long years in different countries in sincere friendship with many people in many lands feel my place to be outside of nationality a citizen of the world, and a friend of all peoples. I recognize the divine origin of all nations, and therefore their value in being as they are, respect their laws, and feel my existence solely as a bridge of good fellowship between them. This is why, on my own ship I fly my own flag, why I have my own passport, and so place myself without other protection under the goodwill of the world. Dibburn's flag also appears in this passport and has an encircled red cross in the center with a blue star in the top left corner. Like everything George did, the flag was highly symbolic. He explained it like this. My flag has a white ground with a red cross of St. George cutting a dark blue circle and in the upper left hand corner is a blue star. The white stands for equal rights, not equality, but equal rights for men to evolve, each according to his individuality. On this right, the human world stands or falls. The dark blue circle stands for the brotherhood of man. For though we fight like brothers, we must grow a loyalty to our one family if we are to survive. On top of the circle of brotherhood lies the red cross of freedom and of pain. It is through freedom to experience and the pain experience brings that we learn. The blue circle also represents a planet, like the Earth, which receives its light from the sun, 
as we have received our light from God. But I believe that God is within each of us, and that our aim should be to be conscious of Him, to become a self-shining light, a star. So, the star in the corner represents my aim. It is a blue star because I try to become a brother of a new brotherhood. Now when I tell you where and when George lived, when he rejected his own nation and committed his life to preaching the brotherhood of all men, this will all start to make more sense, a lot more sense. It was 1940, and it was Nazi Germany. The powerful German army had just annexed Austria and steamrolled Poland in a matter of weeks. It looked unstoppable. Prussian leadership had spent the 1930s secretly rearming Germany for vengeance. After the surrender of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles had banned the country from rearmament, but they did it anyway. And by the time of their mid-century revenge tour, no nation in the world was more prepared for the bloodiest war in human history. Roughly 75 million people would die, and George wanted no part of it. He viewed the racist, violent government of his nation as a crime against humanity. A number of German heroes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Franz Jaeger Stater, defied the Nazis in other ways, through objection and assassination attempts. Dibbern took a different approach. He disowned his nation and left it behind in every way that he knew. He had the courage to create his own flag, representing his principles and views at a time when any German vessel was in fact decreed in 1933 that the swastika was the only acceptable national flag. And uh, so he had the courage to take a stand and his family suffered because of that. Can you tell me how they suffered? He sailed away leaving a wife and three young daughters, for one thing. Uh, He felt that they would be better looked after by friends and the state. And he decided that his mission would be to take his boat, which in Maori means dark sun, the uh, third step in the creation myth. And he would try and become a bridge of friendship. He would take people sailing because he felt if they met on a one-to-one basis, they would build an understanding of each other and brotherhood and friendship. So he did this and he created his flag and the Nazi party in Auckland reported this to the headquarters in Berlin. So when he got to Vancouver, there was a movement on the part of the Nazi party here in connection with the headquarters in Berlin to divest him of his citizenship and thereby forcing him to return to Germany. In the meantime, the Gestapo searched his wife's apartment and threatened. She, in fact, wrote to George via acquaintances and friends to say, do not come back to Germany or else they will put you into concentration camp. He was twice interned in New Zealand, First World War, when he was a young man. But then again, in 1941, when he returned to New Zealand, flying his own flag and with his own passport, and they described him as a spy. Nazi spy sailed blithely into port, they said, and he was on a 32-foot sailboat. No motor, no radio, no communication equipment, nothing. But they were so intimidated by the fact that a German had arrived with with his own flag and his passport. There was a lot of propaganda. I mean, in New Zealand and Australia, even naturalized citizens were put into internment camps. Naturalized German, uh, previously German people, naturalized in New Zealand were put into internment camps. George wrote a book called Quest, which is an interesting read in its own right. The author, Henry Miller, whose work introduced me to Dibbern years ago, was his biggest promoter 
and negotiated with publishers over the years to keep it in print. And it was basically the description of the four years that he spent aboard his 32-foot wooden sailboat with an eclectic crew. He had his nephew with him because he owed the nephew money and he promised him he'd take him wherever he wanted to go. They sailed across the Atlantic through the Panama Canal and instead of heading straight down to New Zealand, he decided on a whim, let's go up to Los Angeles to the Olympic Games. And that was the period that he wished to describe all his adventures his musings, self-doubt. He was enjoying himself, and yet he knew that he could never go back to Germany. And, but also tempered with his bit of guilt about having left his family behind. So basically he wanted to share his thought process. The book sold poorly, and George, living as he did, struggled to collect any royalties. Erica has written the introduction to the new edition, which was released in 2008, and you can buy it on her website, georgediburn.com. This edition, like earlier editions, includes a foreword by Henry Miller, and it was the connection with Miller that drew Erica into Diburn's life, as it did myself and so many others. I asked her, while you were researching and finding all this information about George, Was there anything that you learned that was surprising to you? The most surprising thing was, of course, the connection with Henry Miller, because Miller actually ended up visiting George's wife in Germany. She wrote letters to him after the war. 1946 was the years after the war were the hardest. And she wrote to him asking for help, food packages he sent She needed a typewriter, and he arranged for that right down to undergarments, underwear. If you can imagine how difficult that would be as a proud person to humble oneself to have to ask for things like that. So the Henry Miller connection, which is what got me started in the first place, but to see the depth and the intensity of it and how he wrote his foremost thought. Henry Miller wrote to him as a brother. Those were Miller's words. So they connected immediately. However you feel about Miller, and he's certainly polarizing, his friendship with Diburn was a lovely chapter of his life. Their relationship almost sounds like that of a missionary being supported in the global mission field. And indeed, this is sort of what was happening. Diburn and Miller shared a worldview a common free spirit, and Diburn carried it for Miller around the globe. But all Miller really asked in return was that Diburn live freely, authentically, and continued his defiant protest of bad governments and conventional society. He was basically a couple of years younger than George. But anyway, he was notorious in the States. His works were considered obscene, uh, but bit by bit, of course, as time passed, the uh, censorship laws changed and Miller has written a lot of really interesting essays. He's better known for his Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, the books that were considered obscene and were not allowed to appear in the States. He also wrote things like The um, Smile at the Foot of the Ladder and in latter years before he died, he was well recognized and people are still reading his essays. Young people, whenever they order a copy of my book, I'd say 75% of the time it's because they read Henry Miller's essay about George Dibbern. If you remember our episode on Emperor Norton, you'll note that Dibbern died in an uncannily similar manner, quietly on a city sidewalk. He died in the streets of Auckland of a heart attack. He knew he had heart problems, but he refused to get involved with medication or anything and felt, well, I, what will be, will be. So yes, at age 73, in 1962, he was walking along the street to go and post a letter to his wife, which was dated the day after he died, which was rather intriguing. 
Uh, he died in the street of a heart attack, and it was in Auckland. He was in the process of preparing the boat, and people were kind of wondering whether the boat was in good enough shape to go, whether his health was good enough for him to go. So some people considered it a blessing that he just went quickly of a heart attack. But he would not have been able to live again in Germany or um, live with his wife or anything like that. He had changed too much, and she as well. But it was a simple death. I wanted to do an episode of George because I find him inspiring in his idealism and also in his simplicity. He wasn't an intellectual so much as he was a simple man with clear thoughts and a strong conscience. He was a philosopher in the sense that all of us are. We wish the world was a better place than it is, and we want to improve it in some small way. He had his limitations and his faults, but he did something extraordinary. I certainly don't love the fact that he left his family, but I don't know the details of that relationship, and I'm in no position to judge him. I love that he spoke out against injustice and launched what was perhaps the strangest protest of his Nazi government during its brief reign of terror. And Miller, a misfit in his own right, was a friend who relentlessly championed his brother. There's something redeeming about that too. All of us should have some place in our lives where we put our money where our mouth is and invest time and money in people we love and believe in without any personal reward. And we should also accept the generosity of the people that love us freely, as Dibbern did. Both the American writer and the German sailor have something to teach us in this regard. 